very much for the invitation. In fact, I should have been more active in organizing this, this meeting than I actually could be. I had some, some, some health problems <coughs> that could be sorted out. And uh, so the talk I'm going to give is a bit, um, I would say, Hans Fraunfelder inspired. As, as you know, Hans Fraunfelder who wrote this famous book, I mean, you know, or, or know, know him, but uh, you know, in, in addition, he wrote this famous book, Physics uh, of Proteins, very closely to the, close to the title of the, of the conference. And so I'm in exchange with him since about two years, regularly. Uh, he's now, I think, 95 still scientifically active, and the idea was, of course, to invite him, but we couldn't invite him, and he, he couldn't come. But he told me, so essentially, I could give a talk and, and mention him in the, his work in this talk, and, uh, and this is what I'm going to do, because the, the talk I'm going to give actually is not, of course, his work, but is inspired uh, uh, to, to a large part by, by, by Hans Fraunfeld. Okay, so I'm going to talk about energy landscape picture of cross elastic neutron scattering from proteins, and, and so the, uh, as you all know, this, uh, uh, the, 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 the term energy landscape has been, has been coined by, 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 by Hans. And uh, so the outline of the talk, in fact, uh, is the one you see here. There's first the sort of qualitative picture of protein energy landscapes, and then the way you relate that to, to, to quasi-elastic neutron scattering, NMR, just very briefly, and, and theory. And the second part is <coughs> what you really do and how you actually incorporate this, this, this concept if you really do a quantitati quantitative interpretation of, of neutron scattering experiments. So the first thing is to, to go back to what uh, Hans Fraunfelder introduced, what you all probably know, this idea that the free energy landscape, let me see, I should be, the free energy landscape of a protein, so this is of course a sketch, uh, uh, how it is shaped. So this is the, the, the idea is that you, the protein will actually do transitions, small conformational changes that correspond to the many minima of this, of this energy landscape. <coughs> and so the idea is that you will have a sort of thermally activated dynamics in this, in this, in this energy, in this, in this potential, if you like. And uh, so the idea, <coughs> in fact, it was first applied to interpretation of data from, from myoglobin data on um, rebinding of uh <coughs> CO after flash photolysis. So essentially what, what people realized already in the se late 70s is that you have a very strongly, very strong uh, non-exponential erection kinetics, which you see here at this, uh, on these plots, these are log-log plots. You have the lock of time, and then you hear the circulation energy, or the, the let's say the direction rate, if you like. <coughs> and and this and and the idea is that in fact the you will have this 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 uh, uh, this strongly non-exponential uh, kinetics due to the roughness, if you like, of the profile of the of the of the protein of the protein energy landscape. Now, how is this related to what we are going to study by, by neutron scattering experiments and by spectroscopic experiments in general? So the idea is that you have this Arrhenius law for the reaction rates, and you will have a, a reaction rate directly related in this way to the height of an energy barrier. And you will, in general, express correlation functions as superpositions of exponentials, and so the spectrum of relaxation rates is what, what, you, what is called P of lambda here. And what is important is, uh, uh, and what is typical for these uh, objects like proteins is that they, <coughs> that they have a sort of self-similarity, and so the, the, the these correlation functions, they have a power law decay, which makes, of course, uh, self-similarity in, in this very trivial way. If you, if you scale the time, you essentially always recover the same long time behavior of the of the correlation function so this is this is a very important uh, let's say uh, feature you find in complex systems in general and in proteins in particular and that has been realized a long time ago and also to some extent modeled with a sort of empirical law so i, I go back to this to this reaction kinetics uh, measurements of uh, co rebinding after flash photolysis and uh, you see here what has been found would fit very well 
the decay rate, the, 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 the decay uh, in time, is this, uh, is this not an exponential function, but it's called the mittag leffler function. So mittag leffler was a Swedish mathematician who introduced this function uh, for fun, if you like, in the beginning of the 20th century, and it can be viewed as a generalized exponential function. If beta, this parameter, is 1, you will have a uh, gamma of k plus 1, which means k factorial, and you rediscover the uh, exponential function. So this is, again, and the, the point is, you very clearly see the self-similarity, so the, the long-term behavior of this function is the power law, and you have what is required, what you're actually measuring. So this fits very well the data. And so here's a mathematical description of these things I've just shown. You have here these metag leffler functions for different parameters. You see beta small, beta close to 1. So that is close to an exponential function. That is very far from an ex exponential function. And on the right-hand side, you see the, the spectrum of, of reaction rates, which you can compute analytically. I skip the details here, although they're very nice. So you see, for example, uh, if you go to this blue line, which is close to an exponential function, you see that you get a sort of more or less peaked spectrum of relaxation rates. And if you really go to beta equal 1, then you get a delta function here. So then you have a mono-exponential decay. And if you go to the same thing and you go now to, you look at the energy barrier distribution, which is a straightforward uh, conversion, uh, you see uh, this is that corresponds to these, to these curves here. And you see that the blue line is this one here, that corresponds to this one. So that means that if you really go to, to beta equals 1, you will have a delta function at zero barrier height, so that you have zero roughness, if you like, of your, of your potential uh, energy landscape. So that's, that's a, a mathematical description of what you're actually going to see. Okay, so now how is this related to neutron scattering? So what do you see with neutron scattering? Essentially, you see the dynamics of, of the hydrogen atoms at the pico to nanosecond to many nanosecond uh, timescales and on the angstrom length scale. And uh, the essential point is that in some uh, momentum transfer range of neutron scattering, where you can have the so-called Gaussian approximation, you will have a direct <coughs> relation between, this is what you measure, the dynamic structure factor, this is the intermediate scattering function, and that is then related to the mean square displacement of the diffusing particles. So this is the uh, quantum mean square displacement of the hydrogen atom, if you like. So the hydrogen atom is, uh, the, the reason is why neutrons see the hydrogen atoms is that the uh, the scattering cross-section is particularly high for hydrogen, especially the incoherent scattering cross-section, which means if you have a sample that has many hydrogens, you will essentially see uh, the motion of the, the self-dynamics of the hydrogen atoms. Now, how is this mean square displacement now related to relaxation rates? The mean square displacement is related directly to the position autocorrelation functions of the hydrogen atoms in this case. And this function, of course, the, the has a relaxation behavior, which is then non-exponential, okay? <coughs> now we come back to this picture. This, again, is a picture, but this is now we come, we, we, we try to develop a model, a sort of physical model that incorporates this, this uh, self-similarity. On the left-hand side, th th you have, the, oh, on the left-hand side, you have the, <coughs> the, the parabola of, 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 of a harmonically, of a particle moving harmonic uh, potential. On the right-hand side, you have the same thing, but with a superposed roughness. On the left-hand side, you, you consider now a stochastic, stochastic dynamics in this, in, this, uh, in this potential, which is the onstein ulmek process. So a particle that is moving in harmonic, diffusing harmonic potential, is a, uh, this is a problem that has been solved many, many, many years ago in the 30s. And uh, then, of course, more, more lately, there was a generalization to the fractional onstein ulmek process. And how do you describe this mathematically? Mathematically, you would take the diffusion equation, which would be this left part, I mean the, 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 the time derivative of the transition probability. On the right-hand side, you have the Poca-Planck operator, and here you have a fractional derivative, and this parameter beta can be anything between 0 and 1. Okay, so this is the time evolution operator. And the normal einstein ulmek process would be put beta equal 1, uh, that means the no nothing will happen on the right-hand side additionally. But if beta differs from, from 1, you have uh, a fractional time derivative, an additional fractional time derivative, which is <coughs> defined here is essentially uh, the time derivative of the convolution integral. So in fact, what you see here, if you, if you read this mathematically, you would say this is the normal derivative of a fractional of a, 
fractional integration of order beta, which you find here. So this is just a generalization of, of Liouville's formula, for those who are not familiar with fractional derivatives. This is a generalization of Liouville's formula for multiple integrations of the same function. And for Liouville, beta would be an integer number, one, two, three, and so on. But here, beta can be something else, can be one half, for example. Okay? And that makes essentially the fractional derivative, if you, if you, look, at, if you look at it like, like this, introduces a convolution integral with an algebraic kernel that makes, in fact, this long-time behavior we were talking about, the, the, the what we have seen uh, with these t to the minus beta behavior for long times. Okay, so how is the, you see on the left, on the left hand side, you see this is a, a typical realization of non chain ulmbeck process, and on the right hand side, you have the fractional non chain ulmbeck process, you see the, 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 the dynamics is more nervous, if, if you like, like <laughs> if, if you wish to express it like this. This is, this is the normally diffusing particle, on the right hand side is stock market behavior, you know, so this is actually, these are models that are used in a financial uh, business also. And um <coughs> so you see on the left hand side the exponential function, on the right hand side you see the, the metag leffler function, so this is a realization of such a, of such a, there's a model that gives you this long time behavior that is self-similar. So it's a concrete realization of, of such a, of such a model, of such a, where you enforce to what you what you observe is a power law behavior for a long time. Okay, so again, we have seen this, you the, the correlation function, the position of the correlation function gives you this multi-exponential decay, which we, uh, is in, in fact the metag leffler function, so what we have already seen. But now you, you the metag leffler com function comes from in a context which you, which you disc would, say it's a physical context. <coughs> okay, so these things can be applied to real data. And for example, you can see if you fit coarse elastic neutron scattering data, we have done this uh, a few years ago on neutron scattering data from, uh, from lysosome under pressure to see if the, uh, and how the dynamics of the protein would change if you put the protein under pressure. Non-denaturing pro uh, uh, pressure, non-denaturing. So there's no denaturation, but high pressure, okay? So the, the, the highest value you can take is about three kilobar, and then denaturation would, s uh, would set on. And what you see is, to some extent, is nothing will change from the from the from the point of view of this of this parameter that is describes the fractionality, if you, if you like, which gives you the the, the, the self similarity. So you would say the form of this free energy landscape will not change, uh, or the roughness will not change if you put pressure on the protein. Okay, so this is essential. But what will happen, of course, which is a bit or seems to be trivial, but is actually not so trivial as one thinks, is the time scale will actually not change much. Uh, the time scale is the only thing that will change. The, the, the alpha will not change, well, excuse me. The alpha will not change, but the time scale will get a bit longer if you put pressure, which means you slow down these, these uh, conformational changes, which can be understood physically. Okay, so this is the point we have also seen. This is very important. In NMR, I mean, we are not talking about NMR, but in NMR you measure different types of time correlation functions, which are reorientational time correlation functions. And these functions, in fact, they have also a very strongly non-exponential decay, as we found essentially from, because you can't, can't really measure them, uh, but we found this from computer simulations, <coughs> and we found that we could considerably improve what is called the model-free approach, where people essentially suppose that the, the decay of this reorientational correlation function, for example, of the NH vector in the, in the amide plane, will decay exponentially. We can clearly see that's not the case, and uh, well, clearly see, of course, it's not the measure because you do a simulation, but there are many indicators that this is not an exponential decay, and we found that this model would fit very well uh, for this sort of, of motion. Then, of course, you would have a sort of diffusive motion of the tip of the, re of the, of the, of the NH uh, uh, vector in the, in the XY plane, if you like. So that is a sort of diffusion you're looking at. Okay, just to say that this is um, something you can that has some, some physical relevance, as it, as it really seems. But these fractional Brownian dynamics models, they are not so nice in the sense that they are, they are not physical for very short times. They cannot be physical, and the reason is here. If you look at the mean square displacement, the mean square displacement is related to the velocity autocorrelation function by this convolution integral. This is a straightforward relation. And for very short times, you have this ballistic regime, okay? But if you go to this, go back to this, let me see. Yep. You know, you, you 
if you look at the mean square displacement here, the model mean square displacement, that starts with a non-zero slope. So that will actually not fit what should happen for a very short time. Okay, and what is more annoying is that the time, so that means the correlation function you're looking at, the, the, the position of the correlation function, this correlation function, in fact, will not be analytical for t equals zero, which is annoying because you cannot have a Taylor expansion at for short times. And you know that you have physical uh, explanations, I mean physical relations for the short time behavior. You have the moments of this function. And uh, the other thing that is a bit annoying that uh, all the moments of this, I mean mathematically things like this can, can happen, but it's not so nice to have a spectrum of relaxation rates where the moments all diverge. You know, it's like the Cauchy distribution, uh, where you, this is an example that everybody knows, but uh, so this is not so nice. And in fact, the point is of course, what you should be aware of is that diffusion processes are by definition asymptotic process. So you look at the dynamics and the diffusive, diffusive regime, which means you are looking at them for long time scales. Long time scales means of course, Compared to what? So the time scale is set here. This is the fractional diffusion constant. This is the mean square velocity. And of course, this is kT over m. So that can be expected to be in the picosecond re regime. Okay. So if you look at this thing here, this is the mean square displacement. And this is the behavior for long times. I have put in here this function, which is a mathematical trick, if you like, or something, something very nice to, to, to deal with if you, if you, if you develop theories. This is a so-called slowly growing function that has certain properties. Here I have chosen this property, so it, div it will actually then uh, go to a plateau value. <coughs> so that means this is the real long time behavior, but a bit before long, very long times, you, you have modification due to this function. Okay, again, <coughs> what is important is to know long means long on the picosecond time scale. So in fact, it's not so long for many experiments. That's very important. Okay, and what is also nice, uh, if you if you look at these things from a point of, from a mathematical point of view, is that you can, for example, with only any any perturbation theory, or any complicated uh, uh, physical picture behind, or more or less complicated, you can have a mathematical definition of the fractional diffusion constant. So, what will you? How will you express the, the fractional diffusion constant in terms? of a measurable time correlation function. Wh what will you do? Everybody knows the Kubo relation, okay? The Kubo relation is what everybody knows, but the Kubo relation cannot work for fractional Brownian dynamics. So how has the Kubo relation to be modified to have, again, a relation to the velocity autocorrelation function? And so that's what I found in this, in this paper, this 2011 paper. This is the, 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 the form to put. So also for fractional Brownian motion, or fractional bound dynamics, you can have a relation between your transport coefficient, which is the fractional diffusion constant, to the velocity autocorrelation function. You have to modify this, this expression, the cubic expression, okay? And this is what you see. Uh, this is a, a sort of sketch for, for, for small times. Diffusion is always ballistic, so we have this t to the square behavior, and then for long time, you may have normal diffusion, subdiffusion, and superdiffusion. Okay, and especially if you go back now to the to the case of yes. Where? There? What, what do you mean correction to the d alpha t alpha? The correction is this L, if you like. Yeah. You could, you could, because you... No, it doesn't mix with alpha, it is independent from alpha. That's important. I mean, the important is that this L has nothing to do with alpha. It just goes to one. Yeah, no, the point, of course, is this L. You will see, I, I write it differently later. <laughs> okay, so, uh, but the point is that this L, this slowly growing function, in fact, uh, can be more, 
more general than this form I have chosen here, but in any case, uh, uh, the point is, the interesting thing is that you have a, a mathematical relation between this relation and time scale and the, and the Laplace transform. And that's important to derive this uh, to derive this this coefficient, which I have not detailed here in this in this lecture. The interesting point is also that um, you have the extreme case that alpha is zero, so you have sort of subdiffusion, where you have where the, the the motion is space limited. And then, of course, this is a special case for the for the long time behavior of the mean square displacement, where you would go to a plateau value, and ca and this L then describes how you go to the plateau value of the mean square displacement. And that's uh, <coughs> and uh, in, in this case the characteristic time scale is just uh, the the square root of the ratio of the mean square position fluctuation and the mean square velocity fluctuation. Okay, and now of course you see that now you go back to this time correlation function of the position autocorrelation function. You see that this is related now. This is the relaxation behavior. So this L directly uh, expresses the relaxation behavior of this of this uh, of this position autocorrelation function. Okay, so now, for example, you may have anomalous diffusion. For example, you have the, the anomalous diffusion with a fractional Anschein-Ulmic process, and then here you can you now develop models that will approach this this behavior for long time, but for short times are different. And so that is just to show you in this L, you can just wrap a sort of features of your of your short time behavior of your system to go back. Uh, but of course it's also related directly as, I sh as I've shown to the relaxation behavior and also to what you measure and that's now important with, with neutron scattering because now comes an important point. I told you that these diffusion processes have to be looked at a long time scale. Not on so a diffusion process if you see uh, if you say uh, I have for example the Einstein law so that means the mean square displacement is, is proportional to the to the to proportional to time. Okay, so that will not be true on all time scales. For very short time scales, it will not be like that. Okay, and now comes the point that you may now develop the, the neutron scattering laws, if you like, the neutron scattering laws in, in this in this spirit that you say, okay, in any case, what I'm going to see is the diffusive behavior, so the long time behavior, and all of a sudden, if you if you confine yourself to to moderate momentum transfers that you can use the Gaussian approximation, though then you can write down your scattering law, what is measurable on the left-hand side, essentially to the mean square displacement and just to the asymptotic form of the mean square displacement. Now I've told you that this characteristic time is in the picosecond range. If you're now working in the picosecond range, that is much too fast for, uh, let's say, most spectrometers to be detected. So the high-resolution spectrometers you have in the world, for example, in Institut La Langevin, in, in Oak Ridge laboratories, and they will not detect motions on that time scale. So you have a sort of universal law for the diffusive behavior uh, uh, you are going to see with neutrons that is directly given by the mean square displacements and just by two parameters, which is a form parameter and, uh, and a scale parameter. That is important. <coughs> And if you have space-limited diffusion, of course, you will have this this form here. So this is uh, this is the mean square position fluctuation, and this is again this uh, slowly growing function. So I will skip this part. We have, if you like, use this uh, uh, these properties that fractional Brownian dynamics is not a good model on all time scales to make a model that has still a few parameters, but which is a model that has the desired long time behavior and is nevertheless valid on all time scales, at least gives finite moments and, and analytical uh, time correlation functions. So this is a work uh, I've done uh, together with Conrad and the former thesis student, Paolo Caligari. And so the time correlation function here has, has, has this form, has certain nice analytical properties. You see, for example, these are the different time correlation functions. In this case, you recover the exponential function if this beta parameter goes to infinity. And there's some relation now to, uh, to Brazil, to Konstantin Salis, who has, in a completely different context, uh, defined a correlation uh, an exponential or generalized exponential function, which has exactly these properties. In his case, beta is one over m one over one minus rho for him. So, uh, so this is the only difference, but it's essentially the same function. And again, you have this relation to a analytical form of the relaxation time spectrum and you have also um, an energy barrier distribution which happens to be non-symmetric in this case. Okay, so we have shown that we can make, for example, some, some relation 
to the measurable short-time be uh, diffusion behavior in protein. And, uh, and as I said, this all is then, of course, related to the, the protein energy landscape, as, I've, as you see, herp, as you see on this, on this, on this curve here. Okay, now we come, we go a bit. So this is, if you like, all I've shown so far means you have energy landscapes, but you have a completely qualitative picture, you know, this roughness, things, and this is a nice picture, and the, the Arrhenius law makes the relation between the relaxation rate spectrum and a distribution of barrier heights. But this is, of course, a mathematical definition, if you like. You have a picture behind, but it is something I would qualify as a, as a qualitative picture of protein energy landscapes. So now if you would like to go deeper into the neutron scattering business and to see what you actually really measure, and this is what Fraunfelder wants to do now, because Fraunfelder, as you know, comes from the background of nuclear physics. Uh, got his PhD in 1952, I think, something, you know. So this was the time of nuclear physics and emerging time of neutron scattering. And of course, was also the time of Mössbauer spectroscopy. So Hans Fraunfelder did work essentially on Mössbauer spectroscopy, <coughs> uh, taking the fact that myoglobin you can has a heme group where you fix oxygen or CO, and in this heme group you have an, uh, an iron atom which is Mössbauer active. Okay, so this is the point. This is the reason why they use Mössbauer spectroscopy. And so he came up with two recent papers where he wants to transpose this Mössbauer picture to the neutron physics, if you like, neutron scattering physics, okay? And the first thing he, he came up with is a wave mechanical model of incoherent quasi-elastic neutron scattering complex systems, but the, the model is completely, I would say, it's not completely quantitative. It's, a, it's nevertheless a qualitative model. So the idea is, on the left-hand side, you have what people usually discuss when they, s when they look at quasi-elastic neutron scattering. So you have the elastic line, so no energy change of the neutron between, uh, between incoming and outgoing neutron. And then you have quasi-elastic neutron scattering, means you have sort of shift of line, but you have this big hump, which is due to diffusive motions. Okay. So what you will look at, I if, you, if you had a line, for example, here, that would have a vibrational motion with a certain frequency, okay? But there is no typical vi vibrational frequency. There is no vibration. You look at diffusion, and diffusive motions are detected by what is called quasi-elastic. The, the quasi means, of course, it's also centered about uh, on, on, on zero energy tensor, but with finite width, okay? And so uh, Hans Fraunfeldi says, okay, but this, what we're actually seeing is, is, is this is actually a superposition of many Mössbauer lines, okay? And that means the, the, this, the idea is the following. You have a wave packet. The neutron is a wave packet that goes through the sample. And while it goes through the sample, the system will make an energy change. And it will leave the sample with a different energy. And then you have, of course, many, many you average over many, many, many neutrons. And then you have a sort of average view of this. And you have an average view of all these displaced uh, mass power lines such that you get a quasi-elastic resulting line. So the point is, this is what I say. So the, this is from, from, his, from his paper. So the neutron comes, and the neutron leaves. And this is, the, if you like, the, the, the interaction time okay, between the wave packet and the sample. And this is not completely specified what it actually means, this interaction time. But the energy before and afterwards is not the same. So you have the neutron that leaves with a different, so while the neutron goes through the sample, the, the, the sample does this random walk on the energy landscape, and so the neutron will get out of the sample with a different energy. The point here is that you have not a description, this is a spectroscopic view of an experiment, of a neutron scattering experiment. However, you do not have any idea, a clue about the momentum transfer, because in the scattering experiment, you have energy and momentum transfer. And this is not discussed in this first paper. But it is discussed in a very recent paper where uh, the idea is that the neutron comes and essentially stores 
So there is momentum transfer. So it transfers momentum to the to the to the to the sample, and then this the sample reacts locally like a harmonic oscillator that stores essentially the, the, the energy. And once the neutron gets out, gives the energy back, but not completely because there might be a small fluctuation which is due to energy, f energy fluctuations in the system. So this is the... the so in the second paper, they, they, they tried to, to, in fact, to uh, incorporate the momentum transfer. Okay? There is something very different between the first and the second paper. I think people have not realized that. Here, the neutron is an active probe. It will actually kick the system. In the first, it was a passive probe. It was just watching what is happening. So this is now the, the, the usual way to interpret neutron scattering. But what usual may mean, so this is what we're going to discuss, is because Hans Fraunfelder thinks that the standard way of interpreting neutron scattering experiments is wrong, simply wrong, which I think is not true. It is wrong in the limit in which it is discussed. So what you have, this is the neutron scattering experiment, so you have incoming neutrons, you have the sample, they interact via a very short-range uh, nuclear potential, the, the Fermi potential, and then they leave with a different momentum and a different energy, uh, and a different energy, so different direction, different energy. And uh, what you measure, essentially, we have already seen that is the Fourier transform, the dynamic structure factor is the Fourier transform of the intermediate scattering function, which is given here. So here you have the uh, position operators, and that's very important. Very important because it's always overlooked. People like Hans Fraunfelder and others think that this means automatically you have a description that means that incorporates somehow geometry because you have the position operator. But these are quantum mechanic operators. These are not positions. These are quantum mechanic position operators, and this is the quantum time correlation function, okay? And as I said, if you have self-scattering from the hydrogen atom, this will dominate and it will essentially the self-motion of the, of the, of the uh, hydrogen, uh, hydrogen atoms. Okay. Now, what is happening and what people do, consciously or unconsciously? They do the following. They take this they take this time oh, they take a quantum time correlation function and then they say then they say my system is essentially a classical system so i can replace the quantum time correlation function by a classical one which is unfortunately completely wrong but this is done okay in this limit you see that you can write this intermediate scattering function as the Fourier transform of a very nice uh, function, which is just a displacement probability, which is called the von Hover correlation function. And this, of course, now you can make nice models for this, for this function here to describe, for example, the quasi-elastic line. So essentially, you make all sorts of diffusion models. That's what I've explained. You can have normal diffusion or fractional diffusion, whatever you want, but this is the, the way Neutron scattering experiments are usually modeled. And now, I thought maybe one can make some sort of relation between the, the quantum, the, the full quantum description that is apparently necessary to actually do an interpretation of neutron scattering experiments and something that Fraunfelder would call an energy landscape. Okay? So this is work that is now finished but not yet submitted. So what you see here, the starting point is uh, what I've already used in, the, in the earlier papers, is a completely different form of the intermediate scattering function, which I remind as this form here, okay? Which, if you write it down completely as a quantum time correlation function, has this form here. You, rec you, you see that this is position operator here, and then you have the, 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 the typical Heisenberg picture of the time dependence, okay? But now you say, instead of grouping these three oper operators together, I group these three operators together. And now I see the position operator as a shift operator in momentum space, which will make a new Hamiltonian, H prime, in which the, in which the momentum of the scattering atom, which is arbitrarily taken to be one here, is shifted by the momentum transfer. 
So this is just the shifted Hamiltonian. Shifted quantum Hamiltonian, okay? And this is the normal Hamiltonian. So you see the same correlation function, which appears here in this form with the position operators, is here, has here a completely different form. Where you have just, there is no position anymore. They are just energies. And this has been done by this fantastic pioneering paper, Giancarlo Wick, in the 50s, and actually Hans Fraunfelder knows still this guy personally. It's unbelievable, you know, so this is uh, fantastic to talk to him. And uh, so what you see now, what you can do, in fact, you can uh, easily show, of course, that this uh, shifted Hamiltonian has just the shifted wave functions, the momentum space as eigenfunctions, okay? And now you can, for example, uh, compute transition probabilities between different states of the system, which are just given by these integrals, and these integrals are just overlap integrals. Overlap integrals of the normal momentum transfer uh, energy eigenfunction, I mean, uh, energy eigenfunction in momentum space, and the ones who are shifted. Okay, and if you do that, you can write down the intermediate scattering function in this form, where these are these uh, transition probabilities. And what does this remind you? in spectroscopy. The Frank Conten vibronic transition. However, they, these are, those are taking place in, in, in position space and not momentum space. This is the same because this is what, what you have, the overlap integrals. You have a, a shifted and a non-shifted potential energy. In this case, you have a shifted and non-shifted in this case, you have a shifted and non-shifted kinetic energy, okay? So, of course, as you see, automatically you will get this sort of Fraunfelder type uh, line spectrum for the, for the um, dynamic structure factor, of which is trivial because if you take the Fourier transform of this, you generate delta functions. So this will be the spectrum a sketch of the spectrum, and you have all the, the normal, uh, let's say, symmetry relations fulfilled that tell you that it is more easy for a, for, a, for a neutron to lose energy than to gain energy, detailed balance relation, essentially reflecting the Boltzmann factor of thermal averaging over the, over the sample. And I took the pleasure, which is actually quite a lot of work, to compute this thing for a harmonic oscillator, which is a standard uh, example in neutron scattering theory, and to show that in fact you get the same result as by the normal normal approach, normal quantum uh, approach. And if you do that, you will find in fact that you get analytical expressions for the transition probabilities. And this is the this is an example. Y you see, for example, if you if you have for example now a, a, a neutron that comes transmits a certain momentum transfer which is proportional to this, to this uh, variable here, then there's a certain probability that the system will actually stay in its, sta in its initial state. It can be the ground state or an excited state. Okay? On the diagonal, you have just the probabilities as a function of momentum transfer that the system will do nothing, that the system will do a transition by one energy quantum, by two energy quanta, and so on. And you will, in fact, reconstruct in this way, the complete uh, intermediate scattering function. You can also generalize that to continuous energy spectra. So in this case, you would write down a relation like that. So your, your quantum state would be described by a continuous uh, variable. And of course, you have continuous counting that you will pass from discrete levels to a density of states. And this will be the general form of the the dynamic structure factor. And so the conclusions are the following. Energy landscapes are an intuitive concept to understand protein structural dynamics, but they are not directly probed by neutron scattering. This is for sure. That's our picture, how we look at things, that we relate a mean square displacement to a relaxation, position relaxation uh, autocorrelation function, and then a relaxation spectrum via an Arrhenius law to a distribution of energy uh, barriers. Yeah. 
but this is not this is our picture okay so in this diffusion based energy landscape or classical van hover models you have sort of always implied the classical in it where recall effects so that any impact of the neutron on the system are absent and the neutron acts as a pure observer that's the 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 price you have to pay by the classical by the classical uh, limit okay but what you really measure in neutron scattering experiment if you really want to make a transition to real energy landscapes and what you really measure quantitatively on the quantum level you have to to look at these momentum transfer dependent transition probabilities which reflect the properties of the system the reaction of the system that is kicked by the neutron that comes in that's the real point and it should also be mentioned it has been completely forgotten that the classical fun in the, the quantum van hover theory so if you go back i think this can be a starting point for discussions if you um I don't know, da, 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 here if you take instead of here taking if you if you take the real quantum correlation function you can still define a Fourier transform and you can still define the van hover correlation function however it has not the nice interpretation of a tra displacement probability it's much more complicated however it is correct i mean nothing is wrong with van hover's theory what is wrong is not van hover's interpretation what is wrong is van hover's interpretation in the classical limit Since the battery is tech. And Van Hove thought about this. Van Hove thought about this in a paper from 1958, all papers from the 50s. Neutron scattering after the 50s stopped completely, and neutron scattering became a completely technical business from the theoretical point of view. Fitting Lorentzians and Gaussians, essentially. That's it. Period. No, nothing more. However, Van Hove has thought about these things, and he has shown that the, his correlation function, in fact, is complicated, it's true. However, the imaginary part reflects the impact of the neutron on the system. So the kick is preserved there. But nobody ever read this paper. You know, the point is this paper has received, I checked this on the Web of Science, 28 citations, whereas the normal Van Hove theory received 2000, I don't know what, <laughs> everybody cites this. But uh, in fact, so I think when Fra Hans Fraunfelder thinks that neutron scattering theory is wrong and that the space, what he calls spatial motion models, that is exactly these diffusion models, they are wrong, I think he refers to the, to the wrong model in, to some extent, in, to the classical limit of the Van Hove theory. Van Hove is completely correct. As you see, you can write this, the, 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 this is the important point. Here you have something that suggests that you observe spatial motion. On the right-hand side, you clearly have something that, that suggests that uh, you observe energy transitions. Because this is an energy, and this is an energy, and there is some difference. You know? So this is clearly, but this is the same object. The same object is written in completely different forms, you know. And why is this like this? B this is because in, 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 in if you have normal, uh, if, if you look at quantum mechanics and the classical mechanics, in quantum mechanics, the momentum and the position are not independent. As you know, they don't commute. However, in classical uh, uh, physics, they are. Uh, and so the, the point comes that if you go to the Van Hove theory and you go to the classical limit, that this is the problem. And I think what I've tried to, to, to develop was, of course, inspired by, by Fraunfelder's idea of this, uh, which is an empirical model. You know, it's, it's not he, he, he took old data to reinterpret the data with this elastic uh, model and so on. But I think you can have a quantum theory of, of neutron scattering, which is completely uh, uh, standard from that point of view, but which has this, which is sort of wrapped such that it makes appear the energy landscape. If you start from this weak uh, uh, definition or a form of the of the intermediate scattering function, so I think that would be the sort of end of my. Thank of my you talk. very much. Sir, for your talk. And, uh, and if there are any